Yeah, Overlord. Hey everybody, it's Triple L, and now let's talk Overlord. Episode, I believe we were at 10, but I'm not really sure. Let me look at it here really quickly. Oh no, I can't find the episode title. Oh jeez. Oh jeez, this is going... Ah, oh, great, great. Uh, episode 10. Okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, excellent. Episode 10. So, uh, this was another one of the episodes that I was really excited to see. Uh, mostly because of the Suarez stuff that was happening in it. And... Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty happy. I'm pretty happy overall. I do have some misgivings about it. More because I think I hyped it up too much in my head. But um, otherwise, I thought it was, a, it was a pretty solid episode. It was an actionless episode, but I, I'm, I'm very invested in the whole Suade and Sebast thing. So, you know, that's why I'm, I'm really enjoying this. Uh, but we're going to go into the notes and we're talk about the scene overall. Anyway, guys, yeah, uh, thanks for watching. So uh, I guess I'm just collecting my thoughts here. I, I just finished watching the episode when I'm recording this. So I just have to collect my thoughts. Uh, yeah. So I guess we'll just go in with the Suarez stuff. Because the Suarez stuff is uh, the majority of the first half of the episode. And then the second half also kind of, kind of, a kind of, well, the second half also was a very cool part in the light novel. And seeing it here, I, I also have a few notes. And this is really coming out just because of how different I felt when I was going through these scenes in the light novel. So guys, this, that's going to be what the video is going to be majorly about. It's going to be me talking about um, the, the scenes themselves, the cool bits, and then the parts that I just don't think landed well with me. But uh, yeah, so uh, going with the Seba stuff, I was very excited to see this because this is an interesting clash of Seba's... Uh, loyalties and allegiances and what he was compelled to do. I was very interested in seeing that but the thing that I was really excited for was of course the Suarez thing. Um, I really love any kind of relationship that's being established in anime and manga. I really enjoy when we have side romances. Romance series themselves have too many problems I think. They're very annoying to have to follow but um, action series or light novels they tend to have side romances that are nice and satisfying and so as, as a viewer and as a reader, I really enjoy the side romances because they give you a lot of satisfaction for relatively little investment compared to uh, romance series or romantic comedies. So uh, because of that, I go in with this kind of bias for it. And for the Suwari stuff, I really enjoyed it. Um, I, I, and of, of course, the pivotal moment, the kiss, that is a pretty monumental moment. And that's going to be the moment that I'm going to be using when I this um, when I make the video comparing this versus uh, how to pick up girls in the dungeon that covered relatively similar subject matter or at least covered the same profession. Um, this moment, though, I, I really enjoyed it, and it really stands out when you compare it to other situations across other series. Uh, but overall, just what Suari was saying for this moment, I I really enjoyed it because at the end of the day, like. It is something powerful to say that you would rather never think about your past life and you would rather go with the man who serves a monster than take your chances in the world that screwed you over the first time. Uh, there's a lot of strong things here and like also a girl deciding that she's okay dying for someone else. Um, you know, th those are really powerful thoughts. Uh, that said, when it came to the Suarez stuff, I do feel... I overhyped it in my head just because I felt more excited when I was reading this in the light novel. When I read it in the light novel, I felt like, wow, that was amazing. And that I, I really enjoyed how the characters talk to each other. But here, like watching it here, I don't know, something about it, I was just kind of taken away from it. It might also be because like in my head, I'm expecting so much. Um, it still plays out as a very nice scene. Uh, I, I just felt like in the novel, it was more... There was more dramatic impetus behind it. Like it, it was more drawn out. It had a, a, a slightly nicer buildup. But that really might just be my memories being kind of compromised as time went on. Uh, that said, I, I do overall enjoy it. And for the average viewer, you know, what do you get out of that scene? Well, you get to see that really adorable uh, climax to uh, Sebas and Suade. And it is really cool that a monster or an NPC or someone that was initially an NPC gets to have his life like this. Um, it's a pretty cool concept and 
when I was going into Overlord, like, I can't say that I was expecting this kind of dynamic to be born of one of the characters. So there is a novelty to it, and that novelty is going to earn it extra points in my mind, and I'm really going to enjoy it. Overall, I liked it. You know, I enjoyed it. This is what I wanted to see. I wanted to see that great kiss. I wanted to see the line about I've never shared a happy kiss because that's going to be a very pivotal line when you like to talk about the situation. And yeah, you know, uh, overall, the Suarez stuff, I'm a, I'm a personal fan of it. Really enjoyed it. Now, stuff su surrounding the Suarez stuff has to be talked about. Um, and we're going to go back to Sebas at the very beginning of the episode um, when Ainz was talking about what Sebas was willing to do and whether or not his will was um, aligned with Ainz al Ogon. And you know, this is one of those moments that I was just, I wish that there was a better communication channel between the servant and Ainz because man, like this is one of those moments that if Sebas had said, or if he had ever quoted, touch me, if he quoted him and said, well, I did this because this is what touch me would have done. You know Ainz would have bent over for that. You know that Ainz would have taken that statement and he would have fallen in love with it. And you do have a soft confirmation of that later on when Sebas and Demiurge um, have their conversation or have their bickering squabble. The point is, like, it's it's one of those... Oh, it's, it, it's, it's infuriating because all that's kind of preventing this really nice moment is the servant's unease when it comes to communicating with Ainz. They will keep things from him if they think it will upset him. And especially for Sebas, like we know Sebas has internalized it as a bigger problem for himself, but it's just like, we as the readers or viewers, we know that Ainz would have a very different opinion if Sebas ever said that he felt compelled because that's what Touch Me would have done. It's just, oh man, you know, props to the author for that because that's like, is it irony? No, it's like it's a tragedy. It's it's a bit of a tragedy that it's not occurring. Um, but I really hope it's gonna be a plot point in the future. I really hope that one day he's gonna say that to Ainz. Because it's just like Ainz is also chasing after the shadow of his friends that he left behind in the other world. And seeing even a little reminder of that in that form, I think would make him extremely happy, at least until the inhibitor kicked in and the inhibitor kicked in twice in this episode so that was very interesting one for a happy moment one for an angry moment uh very interesting stuff with that uh the other little note that i want to make for that uh or other critical note was this is touching again on what controls the personalities of the npcs and just sebas and demiurge having their little squabble um that was interesting in that again it's it's cool to see how much their creators imprint on them and so their squabble is a remnant of the volatile relationship that their creators had i i really enjoy seeing that i really enjoy seeing characteristics that are being interwoven into these characters that not are not exactly theirs but it comes out in the way they interact with each, with each other so i really enjoyed that and another critical moment for this moment like this first half of the episode had a lot of critical moments um the thing about debts you know Ein's points back to the girl from season one and that he's like yeah um this girl did me a great favor so i'm gonna do her a favor i like this this is still a very human thing this is one of the things that will make Ainz a better character in that he is able to at least make he's able to draw lines when a villain can draw lines and still be like relatable as a human being if he still has like some kind of human value that villain is going to be naturally of a different value compared to a villain who is only evil. Um, so little things like that, I really enjoy. And of course, Ainz is a villainous protagonist. He's not really a villain. He's a villainous protagonist, but you guys get what I mean. Uh, moving on, let's see. I'm just going to run through my notes here. Oh, uh, there was a very interesting power play by Ainz in the beginning. And this is just like, it's not a very big deal. It's just a, a, a note for characterization uh when Ainz tossed the handkerchief on the ground and like offered it to Sebas that's a really big power move man and that's not that's not necessarily a power move that comes from Ainz being inhibited that's a power move that it takes really embracing the person the persona that he's playing in order to be able to just do that because there's something in tossing something on the ground and making the person 
in front of you pick it up you know bending over to pick up something is a sign of weakness like you are subservient at that point you're bowing your head below a certain level you are exposing your neck it is when it comes to the body language of the situation it's a really powerful move from Ayn, and it's it's one of those times that's really scary just because like this is what makes Demiurge think that Ainz wants to take over the whole world. It's little things like this that he does. And it's just like, it's cool to see it. But at the same time, it's also kind of like, Jesus Christ, man, this man, he's, yeah, he's, he's freaking evil. Or not evil, but he's like, he's a, he's, he's, he's a king, I guess. He's a lord. I guess that really just does fit him. Um, well, he's an evil lord. He's an overlord. So that, that really does fit him. Um, and we go we touch on the more angry sides of Ainz later on in the episode when they find out Suade has been kidnapped and he's going after it because his pride is now on the line or not his pride but he told the girl that he would protect her and like he's taking that pretty uh, hard um, that is another interesting characteristic to the character and we do see that he gets inhibited so we know that he's feeling actual strong rage and then that opens up like um, Ainz has attachments to Ainz Algon Man, sometimes I can't pronounce that. But he has attachment to his clan. He has attachment to his clan's name. And we do see Alberto making the observation about how she feels about that. She doesn't care about the name. She cares about Ainz himself. So him having pride in a name is still something that she personally doesn't enjoy. But when it comes to Ainz himself, it's one of his illogical attachments. And it's when you have illogical attachments like that, that you have the possibility to get angry. And for Ainz himself, He's really maladjusted when it comes to his attachment to that clan. Uh, so it's interesting to see it manifest here. And uh, it's pretty cool to see it for Suarez's sake. So I'm very happy at that moment. Okay, so we're in 11 minutes in. Let's go into the next half. Uh, it's going to be the Renner stuff. So this this scene as well, like I, I was going through it and I just felt it was clumsily put together. And like also I felt the art quality kind of went down and you have it when uh, the Marquise is also like freaking out there you can kind of see like they tried to work with it but it like the quality kind of went down with the animation and the faces and so it didn't feel that good the other thing is that this is one of those ones that I think really could have done with more buildup or more well no not not even like when it comes to an adaptation we want to be able to go through the material really quickly so you know what uh, that's again a personal preference thing don't take it seriously but um, it's just we moved very quickly through that scene we went from the marquise uh freaking out and being fanatical at seeing uh renner change her expression we went through him getting extremely angry we went through renner having her psychotic attachment to uh climb um all those things happened very quickly we didn't really dwell on anything in the in those scenes i would have liked more dwelling on it but again uh if you like fast-paced stuff like obviously you might be more inclined to like this uh Overall, I still enjoy it. Like it gets the point across. It's just this is one of those times I would have really liked to just sit in the craziness that is Renner because she is an interesting character in that degree. Um, now, overall, those are my thoughts. But I do want to also point out that the Prince and the Marquise are also extremely competent, right? Like they, like both characters are able to follow what Renner is saying. So let's put that out there. Like this is pretty cool in that the side nobles are also pretty smart and you gotta like appreciate and respect that whenever like the authors do something like that because usually you'd expect people to not be able to keep up with the genius but in the in the prince's case he knew what renner was like from the very beginning in the marquise's case he was aware of what renner was like and they're both able to follow what renner is doing and they're both e able to negotiate with renner mind you renner's also putting herself in a position where she can be negotiated with but it's still kind of cool to see um the other thing that you have to like really appreciate when it comes to the plot elements is the maids right they keep bringing up the maids and we at this point in this episode we do have it solidified the maids are a critical information network that renner is able to tap into so you know i appreciate how throughout the series they made those connections and how they're coming into play here and how renner is using that to her advantage we've had the maids uh dropped in the last two episodes and now this is the third um so it's just cool to see that plot element in regards to plot elements too and this is like one of those things where it's kind of you wouldn't have a story without it but going back to the suada stuff you know the odds that suada would be the person that seba saves who also happens to be the person that was linked to Ainz because of the thing that her sister helped Ainz with you know when you consider all those things together 
you know, you could tell this is a story, but then you could also play the handball. Like sometimes God or sometimes life works out in really weird ways. And you like end up meeting people who would be like, wow, the, the, the odds, right? But it's just one of those things that remind you it's a story. And it's just one of the things where it turns from serendipity into um, respecting how planned out things were from before. Such that this plot element that you were invested in before can now have uh, better closure. So overall, um, as I'm going through this episode, you know, this episode is just giant payoffs. And now we're going into the next episode, which is pretty much just going to be uh, anger and fury raining down on the, the well, soon to be no fingers. Like, they're all going to be killed. So it's going to be a fun time. Anyway, guys, let's call it there. Those are my thoughts. 15 minutes, whatever. Nice. Thanks for watching. Till next time. I hope you have a great day.